We're going to get started with a clip, another clip, to um, introduce our next topic, which is uh, co-founders and, and building your team. So this is something that, uh, this is a topic that was actually uh, a blind spot for many, it is a blind spot for many early stage entrepreneurs. And um, our, your, your friends, your, the serial entrepreneurs have identified this really loud and clear as being extremely important. So uh, please, please pay attention. And without further ado, um, we'll roll. It takes time to get to know one another. And it's not like all of a sudden you're saying, okay, now we're working together. That's definitely not how it went. There's this essentially a test phase uh, where we both understand that, you know, we're filling each other out and we have the best intentions. And, you know, we're only engaging because we believe what this can be on the high level. Um, but then it gets down to the nitty gritty of, you know, well, when push comes to shove, are we on the same page and how do we actually work together? But it wasn't initially a commitment, hey, we're going to be co-founders forever and we're going to always work together and, and uh, you know, this is a big, big marriage. Um, it was, hey, let's date for a while. You know, let's, uh, let's think about this as a contracting project. It has an end date. You know, I'll help you build this prototype and I'll kind of at least get that out the door. And if that goes really well, let's keep working after that. If it doesn't, you've got a prototype out of it and we can go our separate ways and it's no big deal. I've seen companies where... Um, People have equal ownership and that, you know, if you can make that work, that's great. But a lot of times when that doesn't work, it becomes a really sort of ugly situation because there's no one who sort of has to take control and, and has the opportunity. I think one of the key, biggest challenges we have is really keeping everyone aligned and making sure that we all wanted to be there. I, and that wasn't always the case for us. And it, it's really been uh, helpful in shaping how I view that going forward. I made a couple mistakes. I really gave them a lot of latitude. I kept them around. It was really driving a lot of the, team, uh, the rest of the team nuts. They were very frustrated that this guy is here not pulling his weight. And probably maybe a little later than I, I should have pulled that, you know, that, that, uh, um, that chain, we, we ended up letting him go. But since then, it's been phenomenal. I had actually just come out of a previous startup where I was an early employee. I wasn't a founder, but I was an early employee. And that startup had suffered a lot from fights among early founders. And, uh, and we had not had the right legal structures in place. So in this startup, uh, I knew really early on it was very important that everybody have a vesting cycle. Um, so if a founder left after six months or a year, it was important first and foremost that they not walk away with 50% of the company. But actually what's more important that, about that is not how much of the company they leave with. It's that there's agreement on the table about what is going to happen if they leave early. I think it's important to have that discussion. Uh, you know, what happens if the company uh, has to go separate ways. The most important thing you can do is, is set in the sort of, set in those expectations, at least have that discussion with your co-founder um, in, in the early days. The thing that I see in the successful startups is the roles are well-defined and the co-founder always looks at the other one and goes, I don't know how they do that. It's magic to me. And I have so much respect for it, it's amazing. Like, that's when I see it really work. I'd like to introduce our, our next speaker, um, Jason Greenberg, who's an assistant professor of management at the Stern School of Business at NYU. Um, there are a few, actually, academics who are studying the topic. It's you know, quite important. One of them is Nolan Wasserman. You see his book outside at Harvard. And, and Jason is, is one of them as well. I, um, what I love about Jason is his enthusiasm about the topic uh, and his eagerness to engage with you and the community. Um, and his perspective of how, you know, his work, his research. He, he shared with me that he oftentimes feels like a marriage counselor in his work. So uh, anyways, without further ado, I'd like to um, ask Jason to come up and, along with the panelists. So Elliot Cohen, the co-founder of Karenji, uh, my colleague Lisa Mitchell, um, Elizabeth Irons, the founder of Science Exchange, and Jonathan Bloom, the CEO and co-founder of Podymetrics. So I thought that uh, montage provided a very nice preview uh, for this session. So basically, what we're going to talk about today is the social considerations in founding teams. And uh, we have an exceptional panel of people that we're going to uh, uh, have us uh, provide uh, significant insights into the matter. Um, before doing so, I want to um, show you some data. So I heard you mention the fact that lots of you like data. And you've heard this point made um, over and over in various ways. And that is that founding team issues are the primary determinant of VC-backed startup failures, right? You've heard it mentioned over and over and over again, right? Um, and this quote from Fred Wilson is very much consistent with that point. So for those of you who don't know, I'm an East Coast person, as you could probably tell by virtue of the fact that 
I might be the only person here with the tie, right? Um, so East Coast Business School, please don't hold it against me. Uh, before starting at NYU Stern, I got a PhD at MIT and then did postdoc research at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard. Um, so, you know, Fred Wilson is someone that I hear a lot about. He's a, he's a very prominent blogger in the New York area. And he had this to say about founding teams. And I quote, no, no business is so good that the wrong people can't mess it up. Right? And no business is so bad that the right people can't fix it. So if you don't get the people part of the equation right, everything is really immaterial, right? That's not an easy thing to do. Anyone know who said this? Uh, this quote here? I can calculate the motions of the heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. We're talking about people now, right? Any guess? Any guesses out there? Einstein? Galileo? Anyone else? Newton? Yes. So Isaac Newton, right? So basically, the objective of this panel is to try to think about the madness of people in the context of founding teams. So we're basically going to have a systematic approach to consider this matter. We're going to think about this from a social science perspective. OK, so I'll bring that. I'll bring you some hard data. And then we have a, an exceptional a group of panelists here. And collectively, we have 26 co-founders. I think I counted that correctly. I'll make sure that's the case when we, uh, when we talk to you. Uh, six total companies. We have two PhDs, two MBAs, uh, one MD, an anesthesiologist. Uh, collectively, uh, we have biologists, we have chemists. So I think we have a really nice distribution of expertise that reflect your interests as well. So two perspectives, the social science perspective, and then also firsthand experience from lots of people that are involved in verticals that you're interested in. So I'd like to give them an opportunity now to talk a little bit about their entrepreneurial passions. Um, would you mind starting? Uh, sure. So my name is Elliot Cohen, and my, uh, my entrepreneurial passions are around healthcare. Broadly speaking, I'm, I'm most interested in healthcare delivery. And uh, usually that means using software to make it more scalable or improve the quality in some way, shape, or form, but I'm not tied only to software. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Lyons. Um, I'm the co-founder of Science Exchange, and I'm really focused on how we can use software to facilitate efficiency in, in academic research. And I'm uh, Jonathan Bloom. I'm an anesthesiologist. I'm looking to find the ways technology can empower people to live healthier, happier lives. And I'm Lisa Mitchell, and I ran a global electronic clinical trials business before I came to the Kauffman Foundation, and now I just study you people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm invisible. Is that right? Do you want to introduce me? Or? Yes, sorry. Um, my apologies. I'll grab the microphone real quick. Well, this is, um, I'm so sorry, Stephen. <laughs> this happens from time to time, I guess, in these things. So um, Stephen Carey, CEO of Omniox, um, and you'll see him in several of the clips today. So my apologies again. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Um, OK, so we're going to use this structure, this systematic framework, to think about the issues we're going to talk about. We're going to have a conversation about these different issues. We're going to talk about the relationships among co-founders. We're going to talk about the distribution of rewards and also roles, um, how they're assigned and so forth. Uh, we're going to start off talking about relationships. Um, so I think there are two key issues to consider when you think about who you should start a business with. The first is about functional considerations. Um, you could think about the value of having a lawyer, an accountant, and a scientist on a startup team, right? Um, the other one is about social considerations. And this is something for which we have lots of received wisdom. You've heard folks saying it's about mixing business with pleasure. You can see the cartoon over there. And I want to double click on that, essentially, and start off with considerations about who you start a business with from a social perspective. Um, and there's a lot of disagreement about this matter. So here's an article from the bostonglobe.com. Uh, and it's entitled, Think Before Mixing Business, Buds, Your Friends, and Blood. Okay? And the first sentence reveals the thesis. Going into business with friends or family, prepare for disaster. I suspect a lot of you have similar experiences. On the other hand, you see this article from entrepreneur.com, and it's called Buddy System, and extols the virtues of starting a business with friends. Um, you know, the trust that you have in them, the fact that you know how to work with them. So the question is, who's right? You sample on success, think about it, Apple, Google, Microsoft, friends who started really successful businesses, fantastically successful businesses. Same in the, in the context of family members. So the Johnson and Johnson brothers, right? Varian and Associates, started by family members. So who's right? 
And I'm going to ask you some questions, unlike some of the other, uh, some of the other modules. So you have um, these clickers, and we're going to start off with a little, little quiz here. Uh, generally speaking, do you think it's a good idea to start a business with one, family members, two, friends, three, coworkers, or four, strangers? I'm going to give you a little bit of a prompt here. So you have 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, five, four, three. All right, let's see results. Coworkers, 62%. Family members, 3%. So it's better to start a business with strangers than family members. <laughs> We're going to flesh this out, right? Maybe that's not so surprising, depending on who your family members are. Um, so here's some, uh, to provide some context, I'll show you some data from my own research. So generally speaking, family teams are typically made up of coworkers. To a lesser degree, friends, who you never work with, and then family members. Strangers are a very infrequent source of co-founder relationships, about uh, 4%. And my own research shows that, very much like your intuition would suggest, starting a business with coworkers typically leads to better outcomes. The dashed line over there is the overall sample average for achieving viability. And you can see that those ventures started with coworkers are considerably more likely to achieve viability in the study window. The exact opposite is the case with friends who never work together. I should note that this is a pretty large sample. It's about 1,200 ventures, a representative sample of ventures in the US followed for six years. The model includes something like 50 other covariates. <laughs> so there, there a lot of factors that have been taken into account. And you can see that starting a business with coworkers typically leads to a viability at a much higher rate. And the intuition here is that when you work with someone else, you have uh, the ability to assess them in, in the context of work. You tend to develop common logics about how to organize and how to distribute roles and rewards. That's not the case with friends you've never worked with in the past. Um, I'd like, now like to engage the, the co uh, our, um, our panelists here uh, to fill in lots of gaps here. So the, the data are suggestive, right? But they leave lots of questions. Um, someone made reference to the fact that finding a co-founder is very much like dating, right? That's particularly the case in the context of stranger relationships. You don't know them. You don't trust them. So I'd like to ask all of you, um, how do you go about identifying, evaluating, and then dating potential co-founders? Um, Elliot, I, I think your experience might be uh, well suited to answering this question. So uh, it, it really fits my whole philosophy about how to evaluate an idea as well. I think too often people make a decision in their head they are founding a company or they're not founding a company and they actually haven't done enough pre-work to decide if they really have cause to believe. And that's, that ends up causing a lot of problems down the road. One, it means they commit to a team way too early on. Um, and two, I think it also means that they commit to the idea without actually having any data and they end up in this trap of whether or not there's, um, of whether or not this is, is, they should just stay committed even though everyone's telling them it's a bad idea or not. And I think you can get around that by building into your process events and experiences that allow you to create milestones along the way. And those milestones both give you data for, to have reason to believe and experiences to know whether or not this is the right team. Jonathan, I think you had a very different sort of experience, right? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's interesting. So uh, Podometrics began as an experiment. And actually, you know, I met this guy at, at campus. He was a pretty interesting guy. And he kept talking about this hackathon he was going to have. It was this place where all these people of diverse backgrounds were just going to get together and find things that we were interested in and then start ideas. So I went there just curious to see what the event would be like. I ran into five of the guys. We, we all had the same problem we wanted to solve, which for us was diabetic foot ulcers. And it gave us 48 hours to really get to know each other. You, know, you really get to know someone you're staying up a lot of hours, you know, talking about your ideas, pressure testing things out. But by the end of it, we had the idea of, of the company. And within two days later, we ended another competition at MIT. And then you know, we incorporated and we're off and running. Any other experiences? How you go about you know, dating co-founders, potential co-founders? So for me, I co-founded with my co-inventors, uh, but they wanted to stay in academia. So that presented an interesting, I wanted to build a company. Um, and when I got advice from various wise souls, they, the recommendation was to try to find mentors to help you think about all these issues. And for me, I ended up finding a mentor who I co-founded the company with. So uh, we dated for, I mean, it was really like dating. We had coffee. Um, we went out to dinner. How long was the process? <laughs> How long did you date? Uh, six, seven months. 
50 dates probably, and he helped me with a business business plan that ended up winning some a lot of money. That was a good validation because he took what was an academic PowerPoint presentation and turned it upside down and cut out 30 slides, and uh, it, did, it did well. So that was a good sort of, um, that was a good process of figuring out how we were gonna work together, which was mostly, um, for me, sending me into the lion's den, like hooking attorneys that are gonna commit to us for the long term, in, you know, not sitting and holding my hand, but sending me alone, um, which at the time felt like he was just being lazy. Um, there's a, there's a lot, of, lot of things that you can do with a mentor co-founder where they can, you can see if it's gonna work well for you that they're gonna help you sort of grow as a person. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth? Um, I think for me, so it's kind of interesting the whole dating potential co-founders. So one of my co-founders I'm actually married to. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of literal. Um, so I think obviously I knew him very well. Um, and our other co-founder was in some ways a stranger. So we sort of came up with the idea for Science Exchange, um, bringing my scientific background, so the kind of domain expertise and knowledge of the problem, and then um, my husband is an economist, so bringing his skills in business and marketplaces. And then we obviously needed a technical co-founder. So um, trying to find that technical co-founder, we sort of talked to a lot of people in the startup world and tried to see who could really buy into our vision for changing scientific research and believing that um, technology could be used in a really positive way for academic research. So that was sort of the beginning and then we took part in a startup accelerator program and that was really an intense three months where we all lived together. And um, so living together was, you get to know somebody very, very well and um, we all still live together now a year later. So, yeah. All three of you? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So I want to ask a second question now. So we talked about the benefits of having diversity, a heterogeneous team, a lawyer, an accountant. Um, very often, however, there are these issues about lost in translation. You have the tech person who has difficulty communicating with the business person and vice versa. And I wanted to know how you deal with those sorts of issues with your co-founders. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, I think that was something I definitely struggled with at the start, being um, an academic scientist and not really having a huge amount of knowledge of the tech industry. Um, and so for my technical co-founder, he would often um, struggle to communicate with me why things were more difficult than what I could envision. So I would be like, why can't we just do this? And he'd be like, because that's changing the whole structure of our database. <laughs> it's not simple. Um, so one really important thing was that I tried to learn a little bit about how to code so that I could just have a basic understanding of the technical challenges that were involved with running an actual online marketplace. Go ahead. Well, one of the things, obviously, that we've run um, three or four different kind of Kaufman Labs programs. And I think it was Jay Watkins, who's not here today, but he'll be here tomorrow, who said to us a long time ago, and Ankit and some of the guys that were in one of the first programs, I mean, he said, essentially, you guys are gonna have to learn like communication 101 with somebody, and, um, but not at the level of a presentation, at the level of almost what you see in dating. And super honesty is important, and the only way you're ever gonna get there is to have hard discussions and the hard discussions are the ones you should start with, not end with, um, because you're gonna get there sooner or later, so you might as well start sooner. I, I actually consider that to be a skill, and a lot of what Hacking Medicine was, a lot of the Hacking Medicine events were designed around the idea that that is a skill that you learn when you're pressure tested over 48 hours, and it's, it's like any other skill, you need to practice at it, and so if we put you in that situation, we will force those events to happen, and one of the best things that could come out of the event is the team falls apart, but you learn something about how to communicate with other people that don't have the same background and expertise. It, it, was, it was very helpful to have this very varied team, and we had uh, hard, hardware guys, software guys, sensor guys, I, I knew the medicine, the business side, med device, so in a way we had this team just sort of randomly came together um, but the tough part about sort of blind dating, if you will, to push that a little bit further, was that you know not all of us really had the same idea what a startup was when we were at, showed up at this event. So you know, we fortunately you, you're going to date some duds out there. I feel bad to say that like, he's actually a lovely human being, but he, you know, his idea of what a startup was is so far off. You know, a lot of work needed to happen. So you know, we had to kind of uh, move away from him at, at some point. But um, having that variety was was wonderful. At least getting a, a complex solution to a complex problem. Can you tell us a little bit how you went about uh, breaking up with that person? That might be useful. <laughs> I, 
I don't think I did it right to, if I were to do it all over again. You know, I, I kept him around for a while. I'm like, he'll, he'll, he'll pull through. This guy will pull through. He's a great guy. He's super bright. I mean, he really was one of the brightest guys on our team. Um, and he just, he wasn't. And, and he was starting to really piss off all the other guys in the team. They're doing a lot of heavy lifting and they're looking at this guy. And we go to the meeting, you know, what have you done? This guy brings in all this research he did. He didn't know how to do any of it. He had all this effort to show, like, this is what we could do. And we went down the line and finally got to this, you know, our, the, the gentleman in question. What did, you know, what did you do? We're so excited now. And it was nothing. And so it really just started, we were getting angry in our meetings. So I waited too long. Um, I wish that we had a bigger boy discussion earlier on. Uh, so yeah, lesson learned on that one. <laughs> Put the box on and, his and desk And can I quickly. just make a comment yeah. about that? I mean, this is even a hard discussion for us to sit here and talk about, as you can all tell. And one of the reasons that the only book that we're giving away at this meeting is Noam Wasserman's founding team deal structures is because when we met Noam like eight years ago and saw all this data that he was collecting and learned that 65% of founding teams literally fail because of the founding team structure. Not because the science dies, but because of founding team issues. I mean, it's such an important topic and problem that affects so many people, but it's so hard. It's, you know, why it's like psychology and we need psychiatrists than, uh, more than mentors maybe. Founders, <laughs> counselors. Um, and for the sake of time, let's move on to our next topic. So we're gonna talk about roles now. And I'm gonna ask you another question. So this one's a little complicated. Um, I want you to rank order in terms of uh, one being very important and seven not at all important. Um, these criteria in terms of who gets to take on the role of CEO, okay? So if you think it's the idea, that becomes a, a one. Uh, if you think it's executing, then that, that's number seven. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so rank them in order. Which one you think is most important? Yes, mm. it's a force ranking. Mm. <laughs> I'll start the timer. You have 10 seconds. <laughs> Exactly. Okay. Yep. Let's, I'll stop it there. <laughs> Do that on purpose. Once, it, once the clock starts, it, it goes. Okay? So if you think coming up with the idea is one, give that a one. <laughs> Too complicated. Take your pictures. All right. <laughs> speaking of Noam's research, <laughs> so what Noam tends to find is, generally speaking, people who came up with the original idea assume the role of CEO. And we'll talk about it. I want to engage uh, the panelists about whether that's a good idea or not. Just, this is just an empirical regularity, <clears throat> not whether it's good or bad. This is what we tend to find. Um, my own research shows that regardless of who assumes what role, it's extraordinarily important for the founders to be in agreement about the distribution of roles and responsibilities. So you could see, for those of you who uh, can understand odds ratios, it's, it's basically the, the number of times a multiplier of the likelihood of achieving viability, okay? So ventures that have founders that are in agreement about who should assume what role and what responsibilities attached to those roles are almost four and a half times as likely to achieve viability in the study window, which is six years. And you see the exact opposite for ventures where the founders are in disagreement about that. So getting that sort of agreement in terms of who takes what role and what responsibilities attached to it is critically important based on this research. Um, I'll skip this to engage the panelists, but th you know, this begs a very serious question. Much like the dating process, how do you go about talking with your co-founders about roles and responsibilities? Um, and I'd like to ask you about that. How do you negotiate this process? When did you do so? I guess I can start. We, we came at it pretty late. In the beginning, we were extremely flat. We didn't have any roles and responsibilities. And, and that worked for us for a while. 
Um, after a while, though, we started having spots where someone needed to go up and, and lead discussions with uh, payers or with even the many competitions we were doing. So we ended up needing to, to make this discussion. In a way, it would have been great if we had just done it in the beginning. But now you know, we're all sort of entrenched and we're emotionally, this is our baby. It was a tough part to do. And so a lot of it was just you know, everyone's relationship with everyone else. You know, I had the advantage that I sort of knew healthcare comfortably and I could see where this could go. But it just sort of, yeah, how are you relating with everybody was, was a big part of what that happened. I think the other place where this comes up though are, uh, you may have some guy who's newer than a guy who's senior, one of the co-founders, and he may be a better fit for a certain role, like a CTO or something. So it becomes kind of tough. You know, here's a guy who's, he was part of the original idea, but he may or may not be that best guy. So we're still negotiating those kind of issues. Well, I think for, um, first I just want to say that the whole being in sync and why that is such an important factor for success is because I, I think that's the most important factor for success because if you are spending a lot of time fighting about who's going to do what instead of just getting on with it and getting stuff done, that is going to be a huge problem for you. So um, for us, we have never had that problem with understanding our roles in the company and um, it was very clear right from the start because we had three co-founders with very different sets of skills that they would have these different roles. And so I'm the CEO mainly because um, I understand the vision of the company, the long-term vision, and understand our end users and what we want to achieve. And, and, um, and then we have a COO and CTO, so um, it was very clear which roles would be taken on by who. I have two different experiences in this category. The first one was the first company I alluded to in the video where the founders got in a big fight and it was over who was CEO. And uh, they actually had an agreement on the table about who was supposed to be CEO and then uh, one of the founders uh, geographically moved. And so it restarted the conversation very late in the company's history. And, um, and the conversation did not end amicably. And uh, I, what, what that experience convinced me of is, is you actually need to be really clear about who the CEO is early on. So I think it's a, it's a great early big boy conversation to use, uh, to use John's words. But I, I actually really don't like choosing any of the other uh, titles. I like to be clear about what the roles are, but I think uh, the titles are, are destructive because you don't know that you have the best CTO. And, and actually, that's not a shot on who that original founder was. And it sounds like a demotion when later on they have to change their title because they're really not the right person for the job. If you just never gave them a title in the first place, they can maintain a position of influence within the company without actually having that title. And it leaves you the room to bring in somebody else. You know, so to push the dating analogy, uh, you can envision having a discussion on a second date about who's going to clean the dishes or something like that, right? And it's probably too early at that point to have that conversation. So I think it'd be very useful for everyone here to, to think about when do you have these conversations, the timing issues, because there's a delicate balance, particularly when you're courting a stranger or someone you have a very loose social relationship with, to talk about these sorts of issues. Well, I, I would just say, if you wait until it's time to think about who's on the cap table and what it says, it's like really too late. Um, because that's when the meltdowns all happen, is, is when we're now talking about money. I mean, this is maybe one of the good news about it's when it's family. Um, it's shared money, so maybe there's, there's less of a fight about it. But what we've seen is usually, unfortunately, the discussion doesn't happen until you're talking about money. And um, you could even have roles and say, I'm CEO and I'm whatever, and everybody's happy and fine. But the moment you start talking about money and you know, what we're gonna, how we're going to divide up equity and who's going to have what, all hell breaks loose. Um, and so you know, if you mentally go into these, these you know, an entrepreneurial venture from the very beginning, thinking about that, and anybody that joins you, you're starting to talk about that from the very beginning, you're going to make this a lot less difficult. Um, Unfortunately, that doesn't usually happen. So I just want to make a couple points. When we started Omniox, <clears throat> um, we wanted to, the, the goal was to build a company that's going to be around for 30 or 50 or 100 years, which is a little silly when, you're start, when you've got no money and no people. Um, but it's very clarifying in terms of roles and responsibilities and the kind of team that you build. Um, I put myself forward as the person who was going to build it and lead it because no one else was stepping forward and I was very passionate. But I'm ready to step down if I can't do what, I'm, what, I, what the company needs. And that was sort of drilled into me by my mentor. Um, but if you set the company up with certain principles, commitment to great technology or science, um, commitment to transparency in terms of business, um, understanding 
your, your value, which for biotech I think is intellectual property and how well you've protected it and, and are continuing to, to build it. Uh, once you establish those, that structure and you start to say, well, who's going to be responsible for these different people, pieces? Um, you, you can sort of look around the table and see if you've got the right people in the right seats, I think. Um, and it also, it, entrepreneurship is a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day thing. You've got to be building your company on a daily basis. It's a practice that you can only do if you're at it all the time. And I think uh, that clear structure at the beginning in terms of uh, helps your decision making when things are complicated. Well, let's go back to our roots when things get complicated and what is it that we're about. So we sort of solved our roles and responsibilities by thinking about building a company sort of for the long term. Actually, I think that was, that was a killer discussion you guys had early on too is, you know, what was the perfect ending to your, your venture? Was it, you know, building is something that's going to be around forever, you know, try to sell it off to somebody who's willing to come around to buy it. And I think we were fortunate, it was one of the few discussions we did have early on and we were clearly not on the same page there, but we got alignment after, you know, a couple of weeks and that was so helpful to have that discussion down. What was, that, what was a happy ending to our company? Does anyone have experience with co-CEOs or thoughts on the matter? So this is essentially uh, dividing the roles and responsibilities associated with the CEO position. Good idea, bad idea? I see lots of shaking. No. I, don't have any personal, I don't have any personal experience of actually working in a company like that, but I just think you're, you're punting the question down the pipe and it's like, uh, it's just, it's just delaying an inevitably more difficult conversation and uh, it's not productive for anybody. Um, and you're gonna scare investors to yeah. away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. So the, probably the hardest thing to talk about now is the rewards part, and you've alluded to that already. Um, so let's talk about that. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Uh, this one's easy, so it's just the one or two. Don't worry, harder <laughs> ones coming next. <laughs> But we know how to do them now, right? So, generally speaking, do you believe that equity should be split equally amongst co-founders? Yep, one or two. And here we go, Ted. No. Right. We'll talk about that in a second. On to the, uh, the harder question, right? The more confusing one. So same setup, so now you know the answer to us. <laughs> We're talking about which of these components should, be, uh, should receive a, uh, a premium in terms of equity. The person who came up with the idea, social relationships. Exactly. Yeah, so pick the one you think is most important. Yeah, pick that number. All right. Ten, nine. Very serious crowd. <laughs> Can you make it easy for me this time? Let's see. Nope. Executing the idea. And uh, who came up with the idea? Okay. So to put this, uh, your, your responses in context, generally speaking, irrespective of the role, you can see that CEOs typically get a, a bigger slice of the equity pie. The person who comes up with the idea gets a boost, essentially a, a premium for coming up with the idea. Okay. So irrespective of the role, there's a, a boost and that varies across different roles. How much more equity you get based on whether you came up with the idea or not. And we'll talk about that now. Um, generally speaking, if you come to the venture with co-founders that are bringing roughly the same stuff, functional expertise uh, to the venture, you're likely, more likely that is, to split the equity equally. So that's about financial capital. You all bring uh, the same amount initially. Uh, you have the same amount of industry experience. You're all first timers. So a relatively little entrepreneurship specific human capital. If you split early in the process, you're, you're more likely to split evenly. If you're all friends, so this goes back full circle to the notion of relationships, you're more likely to split equally. And finally, if it's a smaller team, you're more likely to, to split the pie equally. And this begs lots of questions. Um, first off, I wanna engage the panelists. Do you think, um, much like the audience, that equity should be split equally or not? And I know uh, there might be a little bit of a disagreement here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, as soon as I heard that, I was like, okay, that comes back down to that 
ego and greed statement that was made and how important that was. And I'm the CEO and I came up with the idea of the company and it is split absolutely equally among the three founders. We, perhaps just, we, you know, we went to a school that really loves models and, and extra sophistication, but we ended up building this very elaborate, <laughs> almost program to build our part. <laughs> But the part we weighed the most was how much time you're putting in. If you're a full-time guy and you made the full risk commitment, you're in this, you're going to get the bigger hit. So I got a small bump because I was CEO. It's a, it's a fraction compared to a full-time part. Another guy got a bump because he really came up with the idea. And if you're in it and you're doing it full-time, then you're going to be able to run away with it. And we have some sort of, it's like a most proportional ad each month. It's, yeah, talk to me about afterwards if you want to hear something overly elaborate. But when I brought the idea about this, the CTO, the original guy is actually amazing. He's phenomenal. But he... Because of his claims, he's a part-time guy. So here comes in another guy. He's a full-time guy, um, and, and it brings up those issues, you know, on, on not only equity but titles. And I just think that's the most important part. Who's doing the heavy lifting? Yeah. So like I said, we started with four inventors, and um, you never know who's going to be participating in building your company. Three three months or six months, things can fall apart. So our strategy was to start with everyone getting an equal share, but an equal share of a tiny pie with the idea of issuing a lot of shares, uh, incorporating with lots of extra shares. And so when it became clear who was really providing value six months later, when we reorganized the board with two, two people instead of four and reorganized the company in a way, it became obvious what the equity split should be after those founders. So our, our options philosophy is if you're helping build a company, you deserve parts of the company. And if you're no longer helping the company, you're going to continue to get diluted, even if you had an important role on day one. Um, but the value that you provide later and later on is worth less and less because you're getting further down the road. So I'd like to borrow your model maybe just to see how our, <laughs> how our gut has aligned with your analytics. Maybe that's another way to get uh, extra revenues for our company. <laughs> we'll license that out. I asked before you said that. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the process that you go through? Um, you know, whether it be a spreadsheet, what sort of a model do you use to have this discussion when you talk about what are the key drivers for your business's success at various stages of the life course? I can say briefly how we did it. We, we needed to figure out what were going to be those parts we're going to value. You know, is it the guy who came up with it, the time commitments? And we came up with a big master list. Once we did that, we just started iterating on spreadsheet after spreadsheet to finally get at something that made everyone comfortable, that we were weighing all these parts and we all agreed on it. So even though it's, I call this elaborate, you know, we all completely understand it and it really makes, it works for us. Other processes? Uh, I guess I, uh, we, I've always gone through and, and advised other people to go through a pretty similar process to what Steve and John are describing. Um, the way that I think of it a little bit differently is mostly for me, this is just a test of whether or not the team can get along. So I actually don't think there's exactly a right answer to how you have the conversation but more that you use the conversation to figure out if this is an easy conversation or a hard conversation. The companies I've seen where it's a hard conversation basically never succeed, and the companies where I've seen where it's an easy conversation, everyone's actually kind of like throwing equity at everybody else, kind of gets to this, the, the previous panelists talked about greed, like this is a great example. You're just so much more committed to solving the actual problem that the company's trying to solve in the world than you are to making sure you get the biggest share of the pie. Shows, a, I, I think, a good attitude about what your priorities are, and therefore that you're committed to the to the company's priorities, not to your personal priorities. And um, the, one, the one small thing I will say that I, I think can help with a negotiation is ask yourself with your team, hey, what, are the in, what is important in all this? So you can talk about the idea and, and how much value you give to that is extremely dependent on the given instance because an idea that's very science driven, the guy's been working on it for 20 years in the research lab, obviously gets a lot more value than a software idea where he slipped and fell in the shower and had some observation that is definitely going to change the second he talks to his first customer. That's not really like having an idea in the same way that spending 20 years developing new, some new technology is. Um, so I, I do think it is useful. I, I think sometimes models or writing it up on a whiteboard can give you the construct with which to feel like it's really fair. And then you can kind of control for the future by having some sort of vesting. Are you going to yeah, ask about the boards? Vesting is oh, super important. Yeah, the vesting is super important. And you mentioned that at the start. And that was the most valuable lesson, I think, that we got from Y Combinator was that when we first joined, they said, you have to have vesting. It's so important because if you're in a situation where one of the founders leaves and they have a significant portion of the company, that is a disaster. So yeah, I think it's super important. Any thoughts about when to do this again, this question of timing? Uh, this is a sensitive topic to talk about, right? 
you're splitting up a hypothetical pie, particularly very early on. Uh, and very significant fights can ensue. It's like talking about a prenuptial on your second date, right? Mm -hmm. So when do you have this conversation? Well, I, I don't think there's a right answer, but it is a sooner the better, even if it is you know, hypothetical um, at a, a sooner level. I mean, clearly the moment you start having discussions with what I would call real advisors or real mentors, they're gonna start asking you these questions and they're not even necessarily looking at the right or wrong, but how you went about having the discussion for the exact reason that Elliot brought up. I mean, does this team have the capability of even surviving when they get to a hard discussion? I, I, excuse me. I've heard an interesting uh, comment recently where I have been, uh, um, as some VC friends, and they're saying, you know, don't spend a lot of time there because as soon as the money comes in, it's all going to change anyways. So it's interesting. You know, I, I think the key is that you build it up front and you have that discussion, but then you really allow yourselves to be flexible and, and realize that you're, this is going to come up again and that that's safe and it's okay to have that discussion. All right, on to the next question. So let's talk about contracts here for a brief second. Um, do you think that it's uh, very important to have roles and rewards specified in a formal contract? So easy question again, one or two, yes or no? So there's some variation here. Not everyone thinks contracts are essential, right? Uh, research shows, my research shows that they are a pretty significant predictor of venture viability. Wow. So again, you can see the odds ratio here is about four. So four times as likely to achieve viability if you have a formal contract. Um, but this is basically just binary. It's a yes or no question. It doesn't get into the specific provisions, something that you'll talk about in a, in a later module. Um, this begs lots of questions here, and I'd like to talk to you and engage you once again about these issues. How should they be used? Is this a prenuptial? Does it specify all roles and rewards with great specificity? Can it? Or is it something else? Is it a process document? It depends. <laughs> I mean, it, it, de it depends. It, at the very beginning, obviously, you don't necessarily have to have a legal document, but clearly you don't ever want to take any money from anyone um, unless you have legal documents in place. Um, and you know, I, I'm kind of scared even that that many people said no. Um, when I said we factually know that 65% of startup teams and the data is from life science companies and IT companies melt down because of founding team structures. That's a really, really big number um, and, and so I would tell all the people that said no to really read this book. <laughs> I assume you all have contracts? We, we had a team contract where I think we all wanted to align on what's our vision here, what did we want to accomplish, what was the idea of an exit, and then sort of what do, we, what do we owe each other as far as rules of the game and communication. But that was it. We didn't really have roles, and we still don't. We, we definitely need to get that. And maybe even uh, you know, aligning incentives for figuring out so what are those uh, responsibilities and rewards of, but I think that team contract was huge for us and it's, we've benefited from, it, from having it. We have, we have contracts. Uh, in the, we didn't have them the first time, obviously caused huge problems. Um, the biggest problem, which I don't think people usually talk about, is that the, the real issue, obviously, is that people aren't getting along. The contract isn't going to fix that. But what the contract is going to fix is it's going to speed up the breakup process because it's harder to disagree about what the original agreement was. And uh, we had a founder who just was, frankly, completely off his rocker about what the original agreement was. Like, there's just, there were a lot of people involved. Nobody thought that, no one remembered it the way that he remembered it. But instead of it being a really short conversation, it was a really, a multiple month long conversation because we were trying to pull tidbits out of our email from God knows when to piece back together what this original agreement had been that just should have been down on paper. In terms of a, of a win, the second time around that I was at a company, I was actually a founder, so this was more relevant to me. We very early on had, a, had just a kind of a gentleman's agreement, but on paper, so it was, it was impossible to disagree about what those bullet points were. I'm sure it was nothing that would have held up in court, but it was pretty easy for us to communicate around it. And then the second that we incorporated and became a, a real company, we started raising money, we started doing other things like that, that's when we turned it, we had the lawyers as part of the, uh, the founding documents of the company also do a founder's agreement. That was more legal and, and had more structure around it. 
I'd never heard of these before. <laughs> <laughs> but we have lots of consultants and advisors all under contract, and it's very specific what's expected, and we sever them when we think they're not being met. So that's, um, we've definitely used them, but not for the founding team, so that's interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've included in those informal sorts of contracts you've had with the co-founders? Um, so, so it's not legalese, you know, specific provisions, but more in terms of the big ideas. What did you want to include in those documents? Formally. I think uh, f for me, it, it um, like I said, it's very much like I'm being mentored. Um, and so uh, having a harsh critic um, uh, is an interesting dynamic. Um, and it's taken six years for it to flip where we can now, we're now sort of criticizing or critiquing and each other. So it would be, um, some sort of enforceable call out when things aren't going right, so it's corrective, rather than a severability aid, although that would be helpful too. But I think the other thing, um, you just you heard from Nick Fernando on the previous panel, um, when they were starting their company, they had a really, I remember this discussion, they had a really specific discussion about where are we, are we building a full out pharmaceutical company or where do we see this exit being? And clearly, that's a super important, I mean, especially if you're in a therapeutics or a device company, um, even more so because you're gonna take outside capital. That's a really important discussion for everybody to be on the same page, um, uh, or you're really in trouble later. Wow. So this might look like gobbledygook, <laughs> I must confess. Um, I want you to take about a minute to read it, though. I think there's a kernel of insight here. Uh, first, however, does anyone know who said this? Don Rumsfeld. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So why do I think this is interesting? So there are no knowns, right, when you're in the process of, of a startup. You know what people have brought in the past. This is perhaps initial financial investments. It's about the time you've invested in the past. Who came up with the original idea, right? Either you know they're known unknowns, things that you know that you don't know yet, but you will <laughs> encounter, right? So this could be about a pivot, what the business model will ultimately look like, how much money you need to ultimately raise. And then there are the unknown unknowns, the things that you simply do not know and you cannot possibly conceive. And in the context of contracts, and this will be discussed in greater depth in a, in a different module, I think this is useful when you think about different types of provisions. So if it was only about known knowns, you could talk about st uh, static contractual provisions. You get this for that. You gave this amount of money, here's what you get for it, right? There's something, uh, there's a movement towards dynamic contractual provisions. You could think about vesting as a sort of a, an off, offshoot of this. And that is you could provide carrots in the future for things that you know that you're going to, to need in the, in the future. You don't know precisely what it's going to look like, um, but it, it, it has the, the shadow of the future in it. And the last one is something that kind of brings us full circle to the notion of relationships. And that is there's simply, simply things that you do not know. You cannot put them in a contract, and you thus have to trust your co-founders. And this is why social relationships are so important. This is why you see so few ventures started by people that were strangers. That's why you see you know, friends and family and coworkers starting ventures, because you need that sort of trust. You know, so to summarize, and then we'll open this up to, to questions, um, I think it's vital, and research shows this, that you have alignment between the, the relationships, the roles, and the rewards. Understand, much like a dating process, particularly at the onset of an idea, that this is going to be a dynamic process. It's going to take some time, six months, maybe it takes a year. Maybe the person that originally came up with the idea leaves. So you need to think about that in terms of contracting, investing, and so forth. You need to uh, align the, the three R's, and you have to be in sync about these sorts of things. You have to understand what roles people will assume and what responsibilities they're going to have. Um, generally speaking, and, and this was impressed upon several times, don't wait too long to talk about contracts. They're always incomplete. And from my own experience in watching, you know, basically serving as a marriage counselor for lots of startups, I see that this becomes something that a lot of people spin their wheels on. 
everyone becomes something like an amateur lawyer. And they start arguing about the details about their rights and responsibilities and what they should get for it. And oftentimes, this leads to failure, that 65%. Too much negotiation about the contract and not enough working on the project. And the same thing about equity splits. Um, it might at first seem fair to split the pie equally, but that might be the furthest thing from the truth because you don't know about the, the unknowns that's going to happen. You don't know how much commitment someone's going to have in the future for the venture. So an equal split might ultimately be the most unequitable split because of future performance and contribution to the venture. Okay. Um, so I wanted to thank all of you for your time and attention and, and dealing with uh, the questionnaire. I appreciate it. I uh, really wanted to thank the panelists and, and the Kaufman Foundation for uh, putting this whole thing together. And I'd now like to open up uh, the floor to questions. Thank you, guys. Um, as an early stage uh, startup, <clears throat> you know, I've spent a, you know, probably well over a year kind of trying to formulate that founding team. And I've seen a lot of people you know, who have come, become very passionate, very interested in the idea, but they have very similar skill sets. And, and, and I'm a firm believer in finding co-founders that have you know, um, complementary skill sets, but overlap just enough. And, and I don't know if I'm just more paranoid than anything, but I have read the book, and I know that the, the founding team is, is, is so critical. Um, at what, I mean, is, is it true, I mean, am I flawed in my thinking that you know, two designers as part of a founding team would be more chaotic than, say, one designer um, and a technical guy and a business guy that, you know, that may think that they had know a little bit in the other domain or they, they may truly do know a little bit in the domain, uh, but just enough to kind of uh, validate and bounce ideas off of? Or is that just like euphoria of a founding team? I think my take is if it's early on, uh, they're the same thing, but they're both heavy lifters, and they're both excited and passionate about the project. To me, that's fine. That's great. Dream would be that I would have one tech guy, one sensor guy, and you get that perfectly complementary team really leading it. But there's just so much work to do, and we want to feed off each other's energy. So I think two passionate people is better than two people that are complementary in skill sets, but maybe less excited to be there. Uh, one thing you haven't really talked about is the board. Um, do you guys think co-founders should all be on the board or just the CEO or? I think board is more important than equity split because the board decides whether or not to expand the company and to completely reallocate shares. So I think it, personally, I, maybe you guys disagree, but I think it's more important to have a discussion about board control at the beginning, almost more important than equity split. And uh, then it's, that's, I, I think, incredibly difficult um, to to get right uh, before you get investors. And I, I've got all sorts of thoughts, but I think it's, it's a great question. I think the founders should all be on the board. I don't. Yeah, I don't either. I think, uh, <laughs> but most, not, not because, uh, for two reasons. One is I don't think the board is the place to resolve internal conflict among founders, and I think that's what happens when all the founders up, end up on the board. Not to say it has to work out that way, but, but you're setting yourself up for that. And the board's primary role is about outside review and, and forcing responsibility on the company. So to some extent, it's almost like no founder should be on there. You don't actually want that because you want somebody who's really running the company who's also on the board. But, but the main goal is about getting that outside perspective. And I think you lose that when you stack the board with founders. But you also have to be really careful to not lose control over your board. So if you have you know, multiple founders on the board, when you then take on outside um, board members from your investors, that's really important that you still have control over your board. 100% agree with the sentiment. I think there's a different solution to the problem, which is uh, that you're, you, to the same way that you're choosing your co-founders very, very carefully, you want to choose your early board members very carefully. And I don't think just because your investors are telling you they want to be on the board, they may be great board members. Investors oftentimes do make great early board members, but they also oftentimes make awful early board members. And that sa same as with co-founding relationships, that's part of, I think, the dating of finding a an investor. We haven't talked a lot about that, but I also view the, the finding an investor. And actually, I know someone from Practice Fusion is here. You guys had a great blog post a long time ago on, on dating your investors. And I thought it was spot on and, and awesome. It's, it is exactly that process. So I think that would be my only, my only comment. But many investors will insist on a board seat. <laughs> no easy answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
I have a, a question saying. about the some core issue of passion or having the co-founders sort of aligned. One interesting tension I think that comes up in life sciences in particular is the idea that some of the members of the team might be um, clinically oriented or particularly close to sort of the um, patient or the human impact of the, the actual idea and the product. Um, especially as a clinician who is an entrepreneur as well, you get into conversations and you're selling, you're very focused on the patient experience. But what happens sometimes I think is there can be tension with people who are very focused on other reasons for being a company, which is, and they're also very valuable, which is, um, uh, you know, driving um, a revenue and um, making as much money as possible very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in that tension because I think both can exist, but the challenge I think in the founding team is making sure you both agree about what your core values are for that business. Um, so I guess my question is, do you think it's possible to, um, or can you think of models in which people have come together as founding teams who some are really motivated by a big upside and other people are really motivated by um, the possibility of changing the way doctors and patients interact, right? So they're very different core motivations, but do you think such different core motivations can be members of a founding team? Yeah, so just a, a side comment. I think that's where we see a successful team is when they have this mix that you're just talking about. That's the successful team that you need. Everybody doesn't need to be the same. You need somebody that's gonna drive revenue and you need somebody who wants to change the world and impact patients. That's awesome. I'm sorry. actually, oh, sorry, go ahead. Would you have both those people on the board? <laughs> no, I didn't think we were talking about the board. Just, I thought, no, we were talking I'm about the team. <laughs> I, like th that's a really interesting question because personally I, I actually I, I hate founders who are exclusively focused on big upside doesn't mean I dislike founders who are focused on revenue love founders who are focused on revenue for-profit companies responsibility is to generate profit that hopefully they're reinvesting in solving the problem but but when they use words like big upside just in general I found that that is a person who is debating between a position at, in some job that's safe and make lots, makes lots and lots of money and going to a startup. And they've gotten tracked into the startup because they think there is big upside. And there's been a lot of research that's been put out there about how uh, being in a startup is generally an awful economic decision. Totally. So <laughs> if that is actually their motivation, they're going to give up really quickly because really quickly it's going to become <laughs> obvious this is not a great place to make money. So I do think there's a difference there between is their motivation, are they, are they just somebody who's focused more on dollars and cents and thinking about things like revenue, which is an awesome extra perspective to get on that founding team, or do they just have actual different motivations in life, and are they driven, do they, do they, just, they're just, they tick for different reasons? I think you can figure out the answer to those questions by doing the stuff that John talked about, which is what is the vision for our company? What does, a, what does success look like? And what impact do we want to create in the world? And if you don't have that conversation, you won't tease those out. If you do, I think you'll quickly get the difference between we're just in this game for totally different reasons versus we consider different things to be important about how to build the early stages of a company. Hi. Um, I just want to go back to the board thing for a, f a moment or two. You can, you can get, it's kind of like what you said earlier about there's no idea so good that a bad team can't screw it up. And there's no, the board, it's, it's not the structure of the board, it's not who's on the board. You have to actually go back deeper, especially in a startup. The people who put in the money and the people who make the product are the ones that have the power. <laughs> because you can go find another sales guy. Uh, you know, maybe you can pivot and get another product. And so the, the power relationships may well be different from whatever structure you design. It's something founders have trouble dealing with. If you want the money and you want the help, you need to give up the control. And Again, I think you said it earlier, you know, if you, if you can't deal with that particular equation, things are going to turn out badly no matter who's on your board. The other is, and let me turn this into a question, how does the composition of the board necessarily change over time from when you're a little seed thing to getting bigger and then finally when you do an IPO? Well, clearly the composition of the board is going to change over time. Um, hopefully you probably have a few investors in the beginning, but they aren't necessarily even thinking about the big scale. Um, you don't necessarily need the former CTO of IBM on your founding board team. Um, and I love him and he's a senior fellow with us. Uh, but you need him when you're ready to scale that company. And so clearly we see early stage companies that have a board that looks very, very, very different um, than 
uh, two years before they go IPO, which then it looks different, and then after they grow, it looks different again. Um, but I, I want to bring it back to, you know, there's a chapter in Noam's book, come back to your comment here, and I, I really hate even this language, but you'll get it when you hear it. Um, and the chapter in his book is, do you want to be rich or do you want to be king? Um, and the king thing is, you know, kind of about control and how much control as a founder or founding team, you know, is it so important to you that you really aren't thinking about scaling your company? Um, because, I mean, that's the other side of do you want to be rich. That's why I hate this. So it shouldn't be about being rich. But ultimately, if you're going to scale this company, that's the way everybody's going to get rich. Um, and you're going to treat the patient. And you could become a philanthropist and give away all your money if you don't want to be rich, which is great. But it literally, I, I think, you know, do you want to be rich or do you want to be king really kind of helps you think through um, what you need to do relative to putting together not only your founding team, but also putting together your board and how you're going to grow. For the, peop for the people that are coming out of, right out of academia, and um, you talk about before the best way is to go with coworkers for your co-founders, but the people that are coming out of academia, that's not always the best option because they don't really have that. And so what do you think is the best way for them to find those strangers that, I guess, since that could be their only option? Well, that's totally my, my um, experience was coming straight out of academia. Um, and I think it's really hard because I don't think you'll find your co-founders in academia. So you need to really push yourself to go to meetups where you'll meet the right kind of people who'll be able to form those teams. And you, won't, you most likely won't meet them in the lab um, or, re or wherever you're working in academia. So yeah, you just need to go out there and meet the types of people you think will be good co-founders. I, mean, I, I can't speak for um, all of academia, but for medicine, we had this, the worst education on business on the planet. We don't get any of this stuff. So I, I knew that I needed to get a little extra education. I ended up going on to, to business school uh, to get that part of it. But I think that the best part about finding those other people uh, are these, these hackathons you might see around town. Just events where yeah. large groups of people who just want to solve a problem, they all come together. You find people that are sort of aligned in that same problem, and then you, know, you, can, you can find those people there. At least, at least the, the intentions are right at the outset. They just want to solve and make a difference out there. And you can learn a lot of this stuff you, you, with a library card, not necessarily school. Sometimes you can go to corporate attorneys who help startups, and they'll introduce you to a whole network of people. And that's a pretty quick way to get introduced, in my opinion. My name is Jesus Soriano. I'm program director at the National Science Foundation. Uh, we run the SBAR program. And um, I just want to give our perspective in terms of um, um, team at the precede stage, especially coming from academia. And uh, I just want to tell you that we will fund a company with only one person who is still working at academia. Um, but we will look at the team uh, and their track record in a very large way. So for us, the team is uh, the PI, the principal investigator, uh, the consultants you are able to bring, uh, advisors, um, your academic partners who's gonna ask, who are going to do research for you, um, uh, anybody who basically may have a financial interest in your company, regardless of whether you have a contract, shares, et cetera, because we're really looking at the technology and uh, technology that has high risk and high impact. So. Um, these things are, you're discussing are extremely important, and uh, I agree with all of them. Uh, but when you are at the preceding stage and you're trying to look at um, funding like SBIR, at least if you come to, to NSF, uh, you don't need to stress too much about it. OK, guys, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, but uh, we're going to have a half an hour break. So I can, we can either take the half hour break now or by the time into it to get more questions. Any votes for more questions, raise your hand. If not, we'll just take a break. We're going to take a break. <laughs>